Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. Hello to everybody that is here on YouTube watching the live and hello to the people that are listening to the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here today. Today, we are going to talk about something. I get questions and like panicked messages and <laughs> comments about this all the time. The title of today's episode is Help My Chickens Won't Integrate. <laughs> and you know, I just I just get this question all the time and I know that it's something that is really frustrating for people and sometimes it can just cause a lot of anxiety for new chicken owners especially. So we're going to talk about that today. I got a pretty involved question that was messaged to me through my website and if you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, you can go to my website welcome to chickenlandia.com go to the contact section and then there's a little drop down menu and you choose ask a chicken question and is there like a crazy glare on my glasses i am <laughs> gosh this whole lighting thing so for those of you that are watching or for those of you that you that are listening right now i just you know i wear glasses i love my glasses i've got a different pair for every day of the week, just about. <laughs> but some of them, there's so much glare and it's so hard. Like I'll shoot a video and then I'm like editing it and there's like, you know, like these big squares or something. <laughs> like these shiny squares in my glasses, this awful glare. So I guess it's just one of those things, you know. I do love glasses. I used to wear contacts. Um. And then my eyes got dry. As I got older, my eyes got dry. Who knows what happened? Um, and so now I can't wear glasses, but I'm, I'm kind of happy. I mean, I can't wear contacts, but I'm kind of happy about that because it's just another opportunity to accessorize. <laughs> so I just want to say hi to everybody that is in the chat right now. Kiss My Grass Acres is here. Heather, uh, I'm going to pronounce your last name wrong, so I'm just going to say hi, Heather. <laughs> Carmen A. is here. Wilkins Sedino is here from Canada. Amber from Michigan. And Cindy is here from Virginia. And C. Kelly is here. Yay! I believe you are the one that asked this question that I am going to uh, present to the audience today. John Doe 706 is here. And Heather Boudreau is here. It's Boudreau, yeah. <laughs> there, well, there was a there's another Heather here. And I think Heather, I think your last name is Dutoy. Am I pronouncing that right? Let me know. That that maybe that's not right. Um <laughs> so anyway, today I, I just am gonna jump right into this question because um it's it's kind of well, the question is long, but I, I really want to say the whole thing because you got to have, you got to, you know, imagine it, the whole scenario for this one. And I even got like pictures and everything. It was a lot of information that I got um, through my website um, that was submitted with this question. So we're just going to go right into it. And then I'm going to talk about what you can do when you feel like you've tried everything, but your chickens are just not integrating well together. All right, so this is Cindy's story. I'm writing because I really need some help. Right now, I'm just sitting here crying because nothing seems to work. Cindy, I have been there, okay? Chickenlandia has seen tears, right? <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't even have to do with chickens. <laughs> yeah, that's where we go when we, when we feel the struggle. Maybe it's because my setup isn't right or I waited too long to introduce, but I am so struggling to integrate my chickens. I have six-month-olds 
well, two well summer, two bard rocks, and two Easter eggers. What a great flock there. Those, they are going to lay so well for you. I got them at four weeks old and they stayed in my warm, dry basement for almost four weeks till the coop and run was built. It is really very nice. Uh, a friend who is a Finnish carpenter built it like a house. This does sound nice. <laughs> it's eight by four and super roomy with three boxes and three roosts. We designed it on the fly, not really knowing whether we were doing things right. That That is so common. I mean, that's it's just trial and error a lot of times. Um, but it's working out well so, so far. That's great. The run surrounding it is completely predator-proof and is mostly covered. I even used architectural shingles and hurricane hasps. <laughs> wow, that is extra. Okay, so after my original flock of six were in the hen house, I fell in love. See, this is when the, the chicken math is starting. <laughs> I love I love to, to witness the chicken math take hold on the new chicken people. <laughs> I fell in love with four more babies because try as I may, the first six loathed to be touched. They will eat out of your hand and come running toward me when I walk out into the yard, but they're just not cuddly. And, and that, that happens too. Um, so the babies, I got them as pairs at two weeks old, Irish cream leg bar and her mate Hildy. Oh, Iris is a cream, Irish cream. <laughs> I could use a <laughs> Bailey's right now, even though I'm allergic to alcohol. I can't do that. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. Iris is a cream leg bar, and her mate, Hildy, is a Bielefelder. Then two weeks later, I got Gretel, a 55 flowery hen. These are some fancy chickens right here. And my favorite girl, Lysol, who is a silver spangled Appenzeller Spitzhauben. Those babies fell in love with me. They're so docile and friendly. I love them. So now they are 13 weeks and 11 weeks old, and I have got to get them into the outside run and coop. And I know that feeling too, because sometimes it's just like, oh my gosh, they really need to go outside. Like they're just too big to be in the basement or wherever you have them. Like they need to go outside. So I understand that urgency. Um, what's Hildy is enormous. The others are still small, but growing. And I even built a chicken tractor and, you know, Cindy sent me a picture of her coop, her run and her chicken tractor. And it is all very nice. <laughs> Very nice. A lot, a lot nicer than what I started out with. I'll tell you that. Um, let's see. Oh gosh, where was I? Okay. So she took, she built a chicken tractor so I could take them out in the day and let the big, big girls roam, roam around them while they were protected and bring them in at night. They spent nearly two weeks outside in the daytime with the big girls. So, and that is what I recommend. Like you, you have them separate, but seeing. So they are in, like in my run, I have a smaller run within my run. And that's where I put the new chickens during the day. And then I actually put them in a little crate and put them in the coop at night because I want them to get used to that, you know, practice. I don't want them to think, oh, this is where I live. This little, this little run is my home and this is where I sleep at night. I don't want them to think that. And I also want the new chickens to when they wake up, they actually see, I mean, the, the existing flock, when they wake up, they actually see the new chickens in the coop with them. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, when I take them out of the tractor so that they can meet and greet, I throw lots of feed and the big girls really seem to ignore them. So that's a really good sign, Cindy. And when I read that, I knew that there was hope. Okay. Um, but they are petrified. She's talking about the little ones. And when the big girls do pick on them very mildly, they are so scared that they freak out. That, that's pretty common. They just hide in a corner or try to run through the fence. They run and screech when the others barely challenge them. And that's another, another encouraging thing that I read. 
I'm afraid they're just too lovey and tame to stand up to the big girls. And I don't want them to be terrified or hurt or worse, lose their sweetness. That's not going to happen. Um, when Iris calls after me, when the big girls chase her, it sends me into tears and they gang up on all of them because they are so docile. I don't want two coops, but I don't want my littles who are so wonderful to be scared and hurt. What do I do? <laughs> so, ugh, I'm sorry. I I'm sorry that you're going through that, Cindy. Um, I know that it's stressful and I remember how stressful it was when I integrated my first set of chickens and they were little. Actually, I, I had some before that, but it was easier, but um, because they were they were bigger. But the one of the first chickens that I got were these little old English chickens, and I still have one in <laughs> in the flock. I don't know how old that chicken is. 10, older than 10. She might be 12. I don't know. Um, little tiny old English chicken. I mean, they're tiny. They're like the size of a softball. And, you know, I have a really mixed flock. I've got big chickens. I've got, you know, medium sized chickens and I've got little chickens. Um, but these were the smallest chickens that I was integrating into the flock. And I just thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? Like they're going to get killed. Like this is not going to work, but it did work. And at the time I got some advice. Um, and I really think that this is probably the 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 biggest issue and I don't want to invalidate like how hard this experience is but I also want you to understand that when we're witnessing something from the human from our lens our human lens it is different from how the chicken is experiencing it and I know that of course we don't want our chickens to get hurt um and we don't want them to be scared but really the process of integration is going to have some of that in it. It just, not, and not getting hurt. We don't want that. We don't want there ever to be blood drawn. That is really the line that you need to, that you need to lay in, to make. And if that line is crossed, absolutely. You have to start the process over again. And if it keeps happening, then that that's your clue that like, wow, you know, I might not be able to do this. It my my, my flock may have, a personality as such, because every flock has a different personality. Um, and you may have a flock that is just not able, and usually it has to do with probably just one or two chickens, but you're just not able to integrate new chickens into your flock. But that is so rare. And I, I really encourage people and I get a lot of messages where people are like, I'm, I'm going to give up. Like, I don't think I can do this. And I'm like, Trust me, it, it, it can work. Um, it just is going to take a lot of patience. And, you know, I know you guys have seen my flock. I've got itty bitty chickens, big chickens, rooster, all that stuff. And I've never met a chicken that I could not integrate. So all that being said, I just want, I just want to start out first with saying, like, I think it's really encouraging that your the big chickens are really not chasing after or harming the little chickens like that's huge um and yeah the little chickens are scared um and you know hiding and stuff like that but that's really common and and it's unfortunately part of the process of figuring out that pecking order so um you might want to wait until they get a couple weeks older um, they'll get a little bit bigger. Their personalities will, cha will change. The closer they get really to adulthood, the easier it will be to integrate them because their attitudes like a grown hen is, is way easier to integrate than a young chicken into a new flock because young chickens are really insecure and, and <laughs> they don't, you know, they just don't have that, that strength yet that a, that a grown hen has. And a grown hen will stand up to itself for, um, for itself. And 
little chickens won't. And these are like teenage chickens that you're working on integrating. So you might want to give it a few more weeks. Let them get a little bit bigger. Let them get a little bit more mature. Let their attitudes get a little, a little, you know, sassier. And it, and it may be easier. And the other thing I want you to do, because Cindy sent me a, oh, Broke Urban Farmers here. Hello. <laughs> Cindy sent me a picture of her, of her setup. And then, you know, you had your tractor outside of the run on, on the grass. If you can, it would be great if you took your tractor and put it inside the existing run. And let your chickens stay in there all day. And then you can bring, you know, bring them into the basement at night. Or you can, when it's dark, you can put them into the coop at night and then get out there when the sun is coming up and let them out or put them back into the tractor. And that will, they'll just be closer with the flock. And I think it will really help for them to get used to having the big chickens around them and also for the big chickens to get used to them. But it really sounds like the big chickens could barely care less about them. But what's, what's hard is that they're so scared. And I, and I know that is hard. Um, you want to have places for the little chickens to hide. And, and that is normal for them to do that. Um, what you want to see when there is a challenge. So let's say there's two chickens. One is new. One is in the existing flock. And you'll see them go up to each other and they'll kind of like posture. Now, grown chickens will posture against each other. Probably what's happening is there's not even a chance for posturing because the young chickens are, are young. And so they just run away immediately. But that's a good sign because that just means they're like, look, I know that you're the top boss here. And so what you want to witness from that point on is the, the existing chicken or the bigger chicken to just kind of go, okay. And then she walks away and goes about her business and is pecking and scratching. If they're fighting and they just don't stop, that's when there's a problem. And then, you know, blood is drawn. That's when there's a problem. But I don't hear that that's happening. I really think it's probably just a matter of taking it a little bit slower starting the process, process over if you need to, keeping them closer together, putting them into the coop at night if you can, but getting out there first thing in the morning because you don't want them to be in an enclosed space um, because then if the bigger ones just decide to start picking on the little ones, they could get injured. So you don't want that. I doubt that that's going to happen at this point, but you don't want that. So you want to get out there first thing in the morning and let them out. Um, and I think that's probably going to be great. And you can get like distractions for them within the run as well, or give it to them when, you know, when you're having them do the meet and greet, you can get a flock block. Um, I call it a flock block. That's a Purina one, but I, I actually prefer the one from Neutrina and I think it's called a scratch block. Um, you can get them that and that will, They'll be very interested in that. <laughs> They'll be paying attention to that. Trust me. Um, you know, you have, you can give them veggie scraps. I can't remember exactly how you had the run, you know, what you had in the run, but I think you had a lot of enrichment in there for them from what I could see. You can hang lettuce or cabbage, um, give them branches to be on. And especially the little ones, they might want to go up on the, on branches or perches within the run, just so they can get away from, from the bigger ones. But I think it's going to be okay. I think, like I said, you just need a, a little bit more time, a lot of patience and just an understanding of the pecking order and how it can be kind of hard sometimes. Um, but like I said, you just want to make sure that they're not drawing blood on each other. And if they're not, like if they haven't done that yet, that is a really good sign. Because and especially since the little ones are pretty young, you know, and if they're if they're leaving them alone and they're that young, that's a really good sign. So I have hope for you, Cindy. I want you to definitely keep me updated and 
um, let me know how it works out. And you can, you may have been talking to me in the chat and I didn't see it because once I'm talking, I'm not really looking at the chat. Um, but yeah, let me know, let me know how, how it works out and, and keep me updated. So that was my question for today. I hope that you guys got some good information on that. I want to say hi to some of the people that have come into the chat, but I just want to let you know first that, oh, uh, Cindy said, thanks. I have updates I'll send. Ooh, I can't wait to get that. It's mainly one hand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you've probably seen the, the one about, the one video I did about reforming a bully hen, you might want to check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, sometimes it helps if it's, if it's one hen that is really causing the problem of, you know, making it really hard to integrate new chickens. You can remove that hen. You can actually switch it up a little bit and put the hen in the tractor. <laughs> and that may and leave her leave her in there overnight you know or that that may take her down a notch but um i talk about that in the oh what is the name of this why am i always forgetting the name of my videos <laughs> how to reform a bully hen that's the name so um and likely she's she's just dominant and there's going to be somebody, you know, it's a pecking order. Someone's going to be on the top and someone's going to be on the bottom. And that's just, that's just how it is. And even with people, that's how it is. <laughs> I'm trying to get to the top y'all. <laughs> All right. So if you guys want to submit a question to Bok talk, you can do that by going to my website. Welcome to chickenlandia.com. Going to the contact section and choosing ask a chicken question. I get lots and lots and lots of questions. So um, I can't get to all of them, but I try. And, um, you know, I when you submit your question, if it is, if I find that it works for one of our topics, then I will use it. And that's fun. All right. I just want to say hi to some people that have come in on the chat. We've got lots of people here today. I like my new time. Um, we're doing 5 p.m. now, and it's actually working out very well. The Bull's Garden is here, you guys. <laughs> the Bull is my favorite. He's so funny. <laughs> you need to go check out his channel. Alyssa Ann, thank you for being here. Amber, oh, I, I said hi to you before. Amber from Michigan. Lisa, Lis Lisette, Lisette Carlos. Thank you for being here. 13 Moons Homestead is here. My trusted moderator. Brilliant Creatures is here. Southern Blessed Homestead is here. Thank you guys so much for being here. We just have so many people here. Mary S. is here. I just found out about Bok Talk today. I waited six years to get chickens. Oh. And I finally got my first four in May. Yay! That's awesome. That is awesome. Oh, TNS Dogs Dragonflies Farm is here. Hello. Okay, guys. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I am going to open up the chat for questions. Now, um, sometimes it moves pretty fast. I'm a one-woman show here, so forgive me if I miss your question. <laughs> Um, but if you have a question, I want you to type it in all caps in the chat so that I can see it. Um, and it also helps to tag 13 Moons Homestead just in case. Um, you know, just so she can be aware of your question as well. So Southern Blessed Homestead asks, what do you think about hen aprons? Well, I just think they're adorable. <laughs> Uh, I think they're great. You know, um, I have one, I assume that you mean like the, uh, the saddle. Are you talking about the hen saddle? Because there's, there's also like the egg apron that I have, <laughs> but that's for, so I can go and collect eggs. Um, so a hen saddle is like a little, um, it's like a little backwards apron that you put onto a hen and it, it drapes across their back and it, protects their back if there is either 
a lot of the times it's for rooster damage. So, you know, roosters, they can be excitable little creatures. <laughs> And if they have a favorite hen or if they're just too excited all the time or if they maybe don't have enough hens. And so, you know, the hens are actually getting losing feathers from the mating process, then it's great to put a hen saddle on. Um, I have one. It's actually a denim one and it's so cute. It's from my favorite chicken. I'll put the link to that in the description and on the show notes. But um, I think it's great. It's great to use them. And if, you know, sometimes there'll be an issue where other another chicken is pecking another chicken and actually taking the feathers out. And if that happens, what you really want to do is just kind of stop that that cycle. And so people will use a hen saddle for that. So yes, I think they're great. And there's tons of like patterns. You can make them yourself. You don't have to be like me and go buy one. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted my hen to match me. I have like seven denim jackets. <laughs> Don't tell the first man. Uh, Lisette Carlos asks, have you ever hatched chicks with a broody hen? Any tips if you have? Yes, I have. Uh, it was many years ago because now that I mostly rescue chickens, um, Chickenlandia doesn't have enough space for me to be hatching out chicks all the time. And also I live in a subdivision. I'm right outside of the city. So I already have um, a rooster and for a while I had two roosters. So, you know, I really am somebody that has a hard time giving up my chickens. So I don't, I don't want to have to rehome roosters. So that's another reason why I don't do it very often. But, um, you know, it, really the hand does everything. And in most cases, you really don't have to do much. Now you need, you want to make sure that you're broody, you have a good broody and um, you know that she's going to sit on the eggs. Cause sometimes when they first start being broody, they don't really know what they're doing. In fact, I saw, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I saw a, somebody posted like, what is wrong with my chicken the other day in um, a Facebook group and the chicken was clearly broody. Like she was making, she was like, Rah! you know, puffed up and making that sound. But she was on the roost and she didn't know. She, she was on the roost next to the nesting box. And she didn't know that she needed to go into the nesting box and sit on eggs. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> she was broody on their roost. Because um, I was like, well, she's probably sick. But then I was like, no, she's definitely broody. So sometimes when they're starting out, they just don't know what they're doing. And so you don't, you can't really rely on them to be a, a, a good mom yet. Um, uh, usually bantams make really good broodies. And I, I guess the main thing is if you want to be extra careful, you could keep them separate from the flock. And I would like to, I think it's best to keep them separate, but seeing kind of like you do during the integration process so that the flock can see the mother hen with the babies. But usually, even if you keep them together, it, it, it depends on your flock. So always keep a very good eye on them. But usually the, the rest of the flock just knows to leave the babies alone. And the hen also will defend her babies. But if you wanted to be extra careful, you could keep them separate, but seeing, and then when you, when it looks like it's going to be okay, you can integrate them together and just keep an eye on them and make sure that they're not getting hurt. Um, obviously if they're up really super high, if the chicken is up really super high, you want to bring them down um, so that baby chicks aren't flying out of the top nesting box. But uh, it's very, very funny. I mean, it's very fun and cute. And especially if you have kids, it's just, you know, just a, a great experience to have. And, and the, the main thing that I would tell everybody is just to understand that you will get roosters and to have a plan for, you know, what you, what you need to do about that. Because I see a lot of abandoned roosters. I'm actually a volunteer with the Humane Society. I teach a class there every year. And um, I do stay in contact with them. And there's 
you know, I just, I just know that there's lots of abandoned roosters every year and sometimes people just dump them in the woods and it's awful. So uh, just be mindful about that. So uh, let me look at the comments again. Uh, Brilliant Creatures asks, what is the ideal temperature, winter temperature for a coop? So I don't know that there is an ideal temperature. Um, you know, once you start getting below freezing for a really extended period of time, then there may be some concerns of frostbite. So I would say above freezing is great, you know, but that doesn't happen in many, many places, including here. We usually have, I live in a really mild climate, but we usually have uh, a week or two of pretty cold temperatures, meaning it gets below 30 um, or and sometimes into the teens and sometimes even like, you know, nine or 10 degrees. Um, and during those times, as much as I talk about how chickens are winter hardy and all that, and they really are, uh, of course, I also, I get nervous, you know, cause I'm like, it's so cold and my chickens are outside. Um, I have very, some very old chickens and, um, the old chickens I do have to bring into the garage when it gets below freezing. Um, but I'm talking like nine, 10, or I don't even know how old they are. I just know they're really old. Um, and so that's why, and they, maybe they had been sick before in their life. So they're just not, you know, I mean, they're old. So I will, I will bring those in. Um, usually it's not, it's not the temperature that is the issue in the winter because chickens, depending on the breed, um, are, they can handle cold better than they can the heat. Um, what you don't want in the winter is moisture in your coop. That's what you don't want. Hold on just a second. This is, um, water with apple cider vinegar <laughs> because I'm turning into a chicken. <laughs> it's actually, you get used to it and it's like, good. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, when you have moisture in the coop over during the winter months, you really, really run the risk of frostbite and respiratory problems. So you don't want that. And especially if it's moisture with ammonia buildup, then it's like that that's not a good situation. So the main thing, and it's really counterintuitive, um, that you should concentrate on in the winter is making sure that you have good ventilation in your coop. And it should be cross ventilation. You want it to be up high and um, that will help to keep the moisture level down in the coop and also to, you know, make sure that there's not ammonia buildup in the coop. But if you, if you insulate the whole thing and cover every nook and cranny, that's actually, a, you know, a perfect storm for problems. So you don't want that. Now there have been situations where try as they may, uh, people have not been able to keep the moisture level down in their coop and they were having a really bad problem with frostbite. And that that's obviously a, a problem. So um, I have a friend that she had this issue going on and she lives in a place where it's very, very cold for, for you know, a few months out of the year. And she got a radiant heater. So I don't recommend really using a heat lamp in your coop because it, it does present a fire hazard. Um, I hate to say that because the heat lamps are cheap and they're really accessible. And my whole thing is like, I want chicken keeping to be accessible for everybody. But, and you know, we're all just do what we can. That's, that's what we do. But I, I would say that, if you wanted to be, if you wanted the, the best option, the safest option that you should use a, a panel heater and really what they do, there's one called cozy coop. And I think there's one called like sweeter heater. What they do is they just raise the temperature enough so that it's going to be above freezing. It's not, it's not like this heat thing and they're fairly low wattage. So it's a way less of a fire hazard for you to have one of those. Now, the problem would be is if you lost electricity 
in the middle of the night. Like that, that would be a problem. But when, if you're like fighting off frostbite and it, it, you know, nothing is working, then I think, I think it's a, you know, it's fair to, to research those options. So that's my thing. And I have a whole playlist about winter and um, you can see it. I don't know what it's called. What, <laughs> what is it called? 13 moons. Uh, caring for chickens in winter. That's the play. That's the playlist. All right. Next question. Peggy Osborne. I have a 10 month old Orpington rooster. That is strange. <laughs> He never does the rooster dance, nor does he ever mount the hens. He never calls to them when he finds treats. Is he just too immature? Well, um, how old is he? Maybe he's just young. Um, if there's another more dominant rooster in the flock, um, he may just not be doing those things because there's another rooster doing those things and he's higher on the pecking order than he is. Um, and then there's just like humans, there's, you know, any range of personalities and um, there's a, a spectrum where all chickens will fall. And sometimes chicken, you know, there'll be a chicken that is just not super roostery and, <laughs> and sometimes there'll be a hen that's not super hennish and, the, and instead they fall somewhere in the middle. So that's very normal, especially with chickens. Um there's, there's a lot of variation there. So, um, it could be that he is young or it could be that that's just how he is, but he sounds lovely, even though he's a little bit, a little bit different. You know what? That's good. <laughs> Takes different strokes to run the world. Is that what it's, is that, is that it? Different stroke <laughs> to rule the world? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Christina's corner asks, I have been trying to integrate thing two, which, so she's got a thing one and a thing two, <laughs> uh, into my flock for months now. Okay. So thing two was, uh, I just, I just know, uh, Christina's corner. So I know the story of thing two. She was sick for a while. Um, and now she's better. I think she had vent gleat. Does she have vent gleat? Um, she's better now, but uh, yeah. So you, it has been a long time that you've been trying to integrate her. She sleeps in a crate in the chicken shed at night. She is free range and sits outside of their run. Hmm. So, um, are they just picking on her? Is that what's happening? I think you, what you might do, um, Christina's corner is get, if there, if there is a chicken, First of all, if there's a chicken that you see is always uh, making the integration process really, really difficult, you can remove that chicken and put that chicken in isolation uh, while you're integrating the new chicken. If, um, okay, I can't remember the second thing. I was gonna say. It's gone. What's the second thing I was going to say? I'm sorry. It flew away. It flew, it flew south. The other, the other thought I had. <laughs> If it comes back, I will let you know. But I think um, it would be a good idea to possibly remove the offender that, you know, the repeat offender that's making integration difficult. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. You can take one of the hands that you know is nice and put it together with thing two and then integrate them both at the same time. And if you wanted to really play it safe, you can take out, if there's one chicken that's making things difficult, take that chicken out while you're integrating the two chickens back in together. Because sometimes when you have just one, that's, you know, usually people will say, don't integrate one chicken at a time. Now I've done it uh, under, under special circumstances. I've done it more than once, but you know, th that's kind of my thing. Um, it's usually recommended not to, integrate just one chicken at a time because then that chicken will get all of the, you know, all the anger <laughs> towards it. And you don't want that. You want it to be dispersed a little bit. So if you can take a nut, one or two other chickens and put them with thing two, it might be easier to integrate them all together at the same time. Okay, guys, I'm going to do possibly just 
one or two more questions. Heather Boudreaux has a question. My hens lay so late in the afternoon. Is I already know I'm <laughs> okay. Hold on. Is there anything I can do to get them to lay earlier in the morning when they are in their coop before letting them out to free range? And they end up laying, you know, probably all over the place, right? Heather, if there is something that you can do, I don't know what it is. Um, and I don't know if I have my consultant here. I have somebody that's on the Chickenlandia team that's often in the chat. And I don't see her here today. Um, her name is Kelsey. She may have had an idea of what you could do. But I, off the top of my head, I just don't know if that's something that you can manipulate. And I could be wrong. There could be something that you could do. Um Oh, they lay in the horse stalls and the horses break the eggs. Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, I guess you could keep, do they have a run that they are in? That, do they have like an enclosed run that's attached to their coop? Because if they do, then you could keep them in there longer, like for the first half of the day at least, and then let them out closer to dusk. That's one idea. And maybe that will work. But I'm going to think about that a little bit, Heather. If there, if something comes to me, I will let you know. Uh, one more question, guys. Uh, Heather, uh, and I don't know if I pronounced your name right, Dutoy, uh, before. So I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, Heather has a hook beak roo. Trimmed his beak. Still can't close it, but eats and drinks fine. That's good. Very shy at six months, no crow yet, and seems a little on the slow side. Should we rehome or call? Well, you know, you may be asking the wrong person, Heather, <laughs> because as I said before, I mean, I I have a, a rooster that is, is difficult, okay? And I can't bring myself to give him away. Um so, I mean, it really depends. If you feel like you have the uh, the ability to care for him, which it seems like you're caring for him very well, and if he's eating and drinking okay, it sounds like he's he's doing okay, he probably would rather stay where he is. Um, and even if he's shy and not crowing or whatever, I mean, he may be just like that, and that will be how he is for the rest of his life. And that's that's fine. As long as you're okay with it and you feel like you have the ability to care for him, then I think it's great. For, it would be great if you kept him. Um, if not, then I would suggest rehoming, trying to rehome him. Uh, the other thing is, there on Facebook, I don't know if you're on Facebook or not, Heather, but if you are, there is a group and I don't, I'm not in the group and I think there's actually more than one, but there's some groups that are dedicated just to scissor beak or um, also known as cross beak chickens. And they're very supportive groups. Obviously they have a ton of compassion for the animal and they're, they're just will do whatever it takes to take care of them. Um, so you might consider if you're feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm doing this right, you might consider joining one of those groups. Um, but honestly, it does sound like you're doing everything and it sounds like he's got a little quality of life going on. So if that's the case and if he's not suffering and if you're feeling good about it, I would keep him. That's <laughs> I'm telling you what I would do. I would keep him. Okay, guys. Um, Thank you so much. Wow, we got some good questions today. I, I, I really I really like a, a good question. And I do want to uh, thank today my co-producer, Kelly Kelsey Paulus, and my podcast editors at Talking to Grows. They really make this whole thing happen. So thank you very much. Um, again, guys, if you want to submit your question to Bok Talk, just go to my website, Welcome to Chickenlandia. Dot com and go to the contact section and click the little thingy, the little drop down menu, and you can you can send me a question. I love to hear from you guys, um, and I always get interesting questions in every week. I hope you guys have a great week. I've got a really really interesting video coming out on Wednesday. It asks the question, the age old question. Can you deworm your chickens with pumpkins? <laughs>
the controversy. I can I can just hear I can hear the gasp. <gasps> She's gonna talk about that. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna talk about it. Um, <laughs> so that is coming out on Wednesday, um, and then I got some other fun stuff in the queue. So. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Remember, guys, you're always welcome in Chickenlandia. Bye.